about photons behave like electrons in the thermal Hall effect of the cuprates. I'm very happy to share with you uh, a recent paper that I wrote uh, on the thermal Hall effect of the cuprates. Um, it's a short letter, so I guess the presentation will be short uh, naturally, so people will have more time to have, enjoy lunch. Um, so the thermal Hall effect um, is a relatively new field of study. Uh, so mostly it's currently an experimental playground. Uh, so I'll tell you more about the experimental progress on this. And then I'll tell you, while well, reading the experimental papers, I found a very simple and uh, interesting relation uh, uh, in the thermal effect of the cuprates. So uh, I'll first give you the definition. Uh, so thermal effect is really similar to electrical effect. So you have a similar device. Uh, you put a B field in the Z direction. Uh, so let's say 15 Tesla. And uh, so in electrical Hall effect, uh, you send uh, electrical currents, say in the X direction, uh, and uh, you detect a voltage difference uh, in the Y direction. So in thermal Hall effect, you just replace the electrical current with a uh, heat current. So you heat up this end, the heat current goes in, and then you detect temperature difference in the Y direction. Uh, so, uh, well, you can also detect the temperature difference in the X direction, and you would, you would measure uh, the, the thermal Hall conductivities, uh, which is kappa XY. So this is the longitudinal uh, thermal conductivity, and this is the transverse thermal Hall conductivity. So this, uh, so the definitions come from uh, really, so this is by definition, the, uh, the thermal conductivities. Um, and it's, so, so these two are the same because uh, I sum it, uh, uh, because we're assuming an isotropic environment and uh, these two are opposite uh, for the same reason. You put a B field, you rotate it, it should be opposite of each other. So in this device, uh, of course, heat is only allowed to flow in the X direction and not allowed to flow in the Y direction. So, so JY should be zero. And that naturally gives you a relation between kappa XY and XX. So that's represented here. Okay, so that's the thermal Hall effect. Um, and it would be no surprise if we find this in metals uh, because of course for electrons, uh, we have electrical Hall effect and electrons carry heat and charge together. So naturally we should have heat uh, flowing to the left uh, rather than the right, say. Um, now in electrons, we have a Vienna and Franz law, which is a well-known law between the thermal conductivity and the electrical conductivity. And uh, it's derived in many, many different uh, scales, like the classical, the semi-classical, Boseman transport equation, and Kubo formalism, which is fully quantum. Uh, maybe a naive question. So uh, if you got like a two dimensional electron gas, and you plug it into the thermal Hall effect, so it's just a matter of how you drive the current, right? So there's a heat gradient, then there's a diffusion current. Mm -hmm. Those are all conductors as well, quantum and this scale. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So for electrons, it's relatively straightforward. Yes. Okay. Um, so that is for electrons. Uh, the surprise is that uh, it seems that insulators also have this effect. So this is in 2005. Uh, Strong uh, did an experiment, which is you look uh, very similar to our device. He heats one end. And there are two electrodes, R1 and R2, he measures the temperature there. When there's no B field in the Z direction, they have the same temperature uh, in the Y direction. When there is a positive B field, one end is larger, has, has higher temperature than the other. When the B field is negative, then it's the other way around. And here is a, 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 a plot of the temperature difference versus the B field and uh, the scale roughly linearly, uh, just as what we would expect for uh, the, the electrical Hall effect. Uh, so that's very interesting. And uh, back then, um, well, Strom, I think a few years before this, people found uh, some Hall effect in photons, which means they send light uh, into the sample, into some medium, and then they put it in the B field and they find out that light would bend. Um, um, just like the electrons would bend in the B field. And uh, it's somewhat related to the Faraday rotation and stuff like that. The, the median gets 
um, in a magnetic field, things different. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the the spectron was uh, the dispersion was split by the magnetic field. So the left and right polarized uh, light would get uh, scattered uh, unevenly. Uh, so a bunch of uh, complicated uh, explanations, and uh, they get uh, uh, they get a hot back. So Strom thought uh, that um, in this case, uh, we have phonons, maybe phonons behave the same way. And so they, they roughly get uh, the, the, the right magnitude uh, using this similar kinds of arguments. Um, so, well, that's in 2005 and people were satisfied with the, uh, their explanation and didn't care too much about it uh, for a while. Uh, so now, the another surprise came. So here's the here's the material. It's uh, the strong use is for turbian gallium uh, garnet, and uh, so here's a way to measure the thermal Hoyt effect. How strong the thermal Hoyt effect is? You just divide kappa x y by kappa x x, take the magnitude, and uh, it's a percent. So so strong the strong experiment. This is roughly. 0.01 percent, very weak. But recently, people have found that in other types of insulators, they have much stronger effects. You see this one uh, times stronger than the effect before, and they just couldn't use the same argument to explain this new mater materials. Uh, so these materials are like um, very diverse, I would say. Uh, they're anti ferromagnetic materials, ferromagnetic, multi ferroic, non magnetic. Uh, even some key types in liquid candidates uh, were in there. Uh, so um, they're very diverse. Well, so my talk is on the culprits. So uh, it's mostly these materials. Okay. And you see that other than the fact that they're pretty strong compared to the 2005 uh, Strong experiment. Also, the sign is different. You see, this is positive, and these are negative. So they go in different directions, which well, is another sign that they may uh, come from different uh, microscopic mechanisms. Um, so, okay. Um, so tell you about, uh, I'll tell you about the culprits. Uh, so the story starts uh, when, the, um, when Louis Taillefer from the Sherbrooke University, not far from here. Uh, so they were doing experiments on the pseudo gap phase of the cuprates. So they were trying to understand this mysterious phase. And um, so it's, an, it's insulating. So they don't have much experimental methods to probe the uh, elementary excitations in it. So they thought, okay, we'll use, uh, we'll send heat in and see what happens. And they measured the, uh, the and uh, they measured a, a strong thermal Hoyt effect in it. So, um, you can see the phase diagram here. This is temperature from zero to 100 K. This is doping. So they were doping uh, like uh, lanthanum, uh, doping strontium, replacing uh, lanthanum with strontium. And uh, so there's a critical doping. About this, you see the red, uh, the red line represents this one. Uh, it's in the metallic phase. So of course, in the metallic phase, we expect Vietnam and law, and indeed that happens. So, so that's the, the red curve. And so they, 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 they keep lowering the doping. And when you're just, uh, just below the critical doping, you see there, the curve is bending down. So it's going the opposite direction from the uh, And so you keep, keep going and going. And you see that uh, at lower temperature, kappa xy is going down. OK? Uh, and this continues. Okay, this, these are not the same, exactly the same materials, but they're similar. It continues, we keep going down, and so, so we get phase. Uh, you find that, it, that, that this trend continues until you reach p equal to zero, uh, which is the, just a parent compound of the cuprate, the lanthanum cuprate. And you find that uh, in p equal to zero, this large negative um, thermal hole conductivity. So uh, now it's in the antiferromagnetic if we want to understand this, of course, we want to understand it in the simplest uh, scenario, which is of no, uh, with no doping. So in the antiferromagnetic phase, 
uh, they try to do other experiments, uh, find other materials to, to see if this is general to the uh, anti-ferromagnetic mag phase, uh, bunch of small insulators. So they found lanthanum cuprate, neodymium cuprate, strontium cuprate. Uh, they are of relatively similar structure, although there are some differences. And you see, um, and you see that these curves, this is kappa XX of these three materials, kappa XY of these three materials, and uh, they look pretty similar. So it seems that uh, uh, that this is pretty general, uh, a large thermal hot effect may be pretty general to the small insulators with antiferromagnetic order. Okay, so what, uh, just to, as a reminder, so these materials uh, could be roughly thought of as as uh, quasi as a quasi two D materials, where on each plane you have a, a square lattice of uh, of spins with anti-magnetic order, and between the uh, the planes uh, there's a much weaker coupling, so spins and electrons don't don't, uh, don't go easily between planes, so uh, between the Hubert planes. Um. So 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 what's the what's the heat carriers? Um, in this case, uh, it's not electrons We're dealing with Martin spheres. Uh, so they also thought maybe there's magnons. Okay, spin waves could carry maybe could carry heat uh, uh, coupled to the magnetic field. But uh, they also did some experiments where you send heat perpendicular to the Cooper planes. So before we were sending it in plane in the x direction and measure it in the y direction. Now they send heat in the z direction, and they measured similarly, uh, like a similar uh, curve uh, as in the as the in-plane one. So well, magnons don't go easily between planes, so it's also not likely to be magnons. Uh, so what's left uh, by process of elimination, uh, the most likely candidate is phonons. Um, well, another justification with this is that we know that phonons would dominate the longitudinal con uh, heat conductivity. And you see that the transfer, uh, the transverse ones scale roughly similarly, like increase and decrease uh, together as the longitudinal ones. It's uh, another justification for uh, this claim that it's because of phonons. Okay, so here's where my work starts. It's, it's really pretty simple. I wanted to just focus on these curves, like this, this two. Especially, I just stare at it for a while because next slide is a magic trick. Okay, here's what happens. That's the lanthanum cuprate. This is the strong uh, strontium cuprate. So I took so, so on the top row there's kappa xx. This is kappa xy. So I just take the top column and square it and divide by the second column and get a straight line, which is. <laughs> Totally un unexpected, uh, and it turns out that this, this this special weird ratio has a name. It's the inverse of the Hall resistivity, which is okay. Th that's kappa. Uh, resistivity is kappa. Okay. Hall resistivity, uh, well, thermal resistivity, which is this inverse, and then the matrix element, uh, the off diagonal matrix element of this. Um, so. The inverse thermal hole resistivity scale linearly with temperature, um, and uh, well, this is very special. I just uh, took their data and plot it in a slightly different way, and there seems to be a a very simple and uh, also stringent relation uh, on the thermal hole effects of the cuprates. And so, if you come up with a new um, theory on the cuprates on the thermal hole effect of cuprates. You must be able to predict this, right? Uh, okay, so kappa y one, uh, well, kappa y y is equal to kappa x x. Yeah, yeah we could kappa x x, kappa y y, and kappa x y <laughs> if it looks more symmetric. And... <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not an experimental group, but I, I think they only attach electrodes. Uh, yeah, they don't attach that many electrodes. Um, yeah, but, okay. So that's for the undoped cases. Um, 
so we went on to examine the doped cases. Uh, so this is co-doped uh, cuprit. Uh, the phase diagram is over here. So it's halfway in the pseudo-gap phase and halfway actually in the metallic phase. Uh, but actually there's no electrons because, because this, this is a C-axis measurement, which means we're sending heat in the Z direction. Electrons don't travel between planes. So in the whole doped cases, we find a, a similar linear relation, although um, well, the low T data are lacking, but you can see that it's pretty linear. Uh, even in a whole doped cases, uh, close, close to the critical point, critical doping. Uh, so this like further confirms that because we're sending heat in the Z direction, this effect, this linear relation is due to phonons. So that's the photo cases. We also have electron dope cuprits. Um, this set two different dopings. At 4%, it's still in the antiferromagnetic phase. At 17%, uh, it's, uh, it's a superconducting phase, but when you put the strong field, it's suppressed. So um, I think it's uh, like a strange metal phase or something. Uh, so in these two cases, you don't get perfect linear relation be, uh, between zero and 100 K, but you get linear relation in some uh, temperature regimes, like this way, uh, this is pretty linear. And uh, this is uh, like experiments down in different, uh, um, in different magnetic fields. So it seems that this linear relation is pretty general. You find it in parent compounds, in whole doped cuprits, in uh, electron doped cuprits. Uh, so what's, what's the, why? Why do we get this relation? Can you find a theoretical explanation for this? Uh, so, so I thought uh, what would be uh, the simplest uh, transport model? Uh, that would be the Jude model. Well, the Jude model shouldn't apply here because it describes charged particles, electrons, but whatever, just stay with me. Uh, so in the Jude model, I'll remind you that, okay, this is the electrical conductivity or student conductivity. This is the uh, transfers so like pole conductivity, and you see that it's something special that sigma x y scales like proportional is proportional to tau and sigma x x. The sigma sigma x x is itself proportional to tau, so this should should be proportional to tau squared, like the re relaxation is times squared. So this ratio, where you square one and divide it by the other, actually cancels out uh, the relaxation time, which is usually a highly uh, non-trivial changes changing with uh, with respect to temperature and frequency. Uh, so you get this ratio, which is independent, essentially independent of temperature. And if you use the Feynman Franz law, we can immediately turn this ratio into the thermal ones, uh, into the thermal conductivities. And they have this exact <laughs> I don't know why, but they have this exact linear scaling with temperature. Um, so that's a mystery. That's thus the title of photon behaves in electrons in a thermal Hall effect of cuprates. Um, so, well, that's, <laughs> I don't know how to, what to do with this, but um, so a more real realistic model would be to uh, use the Boltzmann transport to uh, discuss what happens to phonons. Uh, so that would be uh, the Boltzmann transport formalism. So in Boltzmann transport, you put a temperature gradient, uh, which drives a um, uneven distribution um, of phonons in the, say, in the X direction. And then you have a relaxation time. So that's the usual relaxation time uh, uh, in the longitudinal direction. But now in order to have some, some Hall effect, we need to assume something that breaks time re reversal symmetry. So we assume, uh, like it's the, the phonons scatter into something we don't know what what it is, but it's but but, but it's still, uh, which means that it scatters things more to the left than the right. Uh, so we assume a skew scattering term in the collision kernel, uh, and um, it's, it's roughly of this form. And with this, we could define a, uh, a skew scattering rate, how inverse. Uh, and uh, in the low temperature limit, uh, well, usually in these calculations, there's an integral where low temperature limit, you could approximate it to a constant. 
and things simplify uh, pretty much to this, where kappa xx uh, is heat capacity, velocity squared, sound velocity squared, and uh, relaxation time, kappa xy is this is tau squared, and then this, uh, this skew scattering rate. And so with this, the ratio became a quantity that's uh, that depends on heat capacity, sound velocity, but that's usually fixed, uh, constant, uh, and uh, the skew scattering time. Okay, so if you assume uh, a low temperature, the Debye model, uh, where heat capacity scales at t squared, uh, t t cubed, then uh, you have to assume, in order to get a linear in t uh, relation, you have to assume that the tau that the skew scattering rate goes as uh, frequency squared, or like it's, it's the same as the temperature squared. Um, so that would be the, the Boseman formalism. But of course, um, this is also not very satisfactory because this approximation of the bi model doesn't work too well. It works well before 50K, and then it starts to deviate something like uh, uh, this is probably. 50k. Uh, um, so this, is, this only explains the low temperature regime. And uh, so why this applies? So generally from zero to 100, uh, it's still kind of mysterious. Uh, so many, many remaining questions. Uh, one is we still don't have a microscopic mechanism for this linear relation. Um, we only assume some empirical models adding like artificial skew scattering terms uh, in the model. Uh, we're, we're still not sure what a microscopic mechanism is. Like we searched uh, for many theoretical papers, well, they have many explanations. Like uh, some are intrinsic, like uh, one of magnon coupling, uh, some are extrinsic scattering of impurities, of um, resonance scattering, and uh, domain wall scattering and all that, but I don't find, uh, I haven't found a relation like this uh, from their theory. Um, the second question would be, uh, to what extent is this universal? Uh, actually, you remember in the in my installators, there's the, there's the neolinear cooper, I didn't show it, because uh, it doesn't fit quite well with the, the trend, it's not quite linear, there's some problems with it. and. Uh, also, you have strontium pythonate, which also has a large thermal Hall effect, but it's not linear. It's, uh, this, this is also not anti-ferromagnetic. Uh, so um, well, probably that's why. Uh, the third question would be, uh, so you see that many of the, in many of the cases, uh, the material is anti-ferromagnetic. Uh, if, if it's not magnons that are transporting heat, uh, uh, then what is it? So like, what's the role of anti-ferromagnetism uh, in this effect? Um, so many open questions. Uh, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, mysterious talk. <laughs> Any questions? Um, yeah. Thank you, Marcelo. In the examples that you know where you are doing very fast, this is the uh, 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 for example, well, in this case, you know what, uh, what, what you can write down an equation where you can put a coefficient here, you put it there, and then you assume some coefficients here, and then you get. That is roughly okay, it's related to the heat capacity coefficient and then sound velocity, uh, maybe the skew scattering rate. So, so this this a coefficient so it would be mostly related to this. Well, actually, there's there's very less data on the lanthanum cuprate, uh, the heat capacity of lanthanum cuprate. So we lack some information to really check the magnitude. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, in some measurements, they do the C axis measurements. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one year. Yeah, well, they'll, they'll be. They'll be. Yeah.
that would be one possibility. So the magnum phonon coupling uh, would be uh, one of the intrinsic effects. I think people have written papers about this, but but the, the, the general consensus now is that uh, intrinsic effects are not strong enough to produce this magnitude of thermal hot effect. Um, yeah, so I think more people are now towards the extrinsic scattering of impurities, domain walls. It doesn't have, uh, there, there are also cases of, uh, of cubic antiferromagnets, uh, not quasi 2 these uh, ones that also uh, have a large thermal hot effect, but uh, it doesn't have this linear relation. It's actually more like the, I found that as so one of the materials. I think it's something I've got the coefficients. Uh, it's more, uh, this is, so now the row H, uh, now this is linear uh, roughly here <laughs> instead of uh, instead of the inverse. So you get a large variety of, of stuff, uh, but also, whatever, even if it's not linear, it's usually simpler than the plus they usually give uh, because you divide out, in a sense, you divide out the taxation time. Yeah, maybe a last one can ask, is there some reasoning or some, some thought of why the skew scattering rate would go like T square for small temperature? Ah, well, okay. Uh, that, uh, well, currently in the argument, we, we say that it has to be this in order for it to be linear. Yeah, like of course, an independent. And, and, and usually, usually the scattering rate scales higher than omega. For example, in impurity scattering, it usually scales as omega to the fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, so omega square is actually, um, I would think, pretty special. Maybe the domain wall scattering or boundary scattering or something would have this low frequency dependence. But um, so I've searched, <laughs> but uh, I don't have. Currently, I don't have a good explanation for why nice. this range, you know, and why this proportionality. All right. So thank you very much again for this nice talk. Thank you. Lunch time, and we reconvene at. Hmm.